Come on and lift your hands tonight as we begin our recovery church service tonight. Somebody come on and tell the Lord, thank you for thank being you here Lord. tonight. We're glad to be able to make it here safely tonight. We're glad to be broadcasting into cyberspace. We know that it doesn't matter if there's one or two or three of us be gathered together. He's in the midst of us. And we're thankful for being here tonight. I just want to open up the service tonight and welcome everybody in. Uh, that's watching us live on Facebook, or perhaps you're watching uh, an hour or a day or later after it has been taped and published. We thank you for being here tonight and helping us celebrate recovery. Amen. Recovery Church of Norfolk is a church in the network of recovery churches reaching and training those in early recovery to grow in their faith and recovery. Uh, Recovery Church in Norfolk is a bridge between the 12 step fellowships and the church. We train, coach, and help people learn to become disciples and disciple makers within the recovery community. Uh, we meet every Friday at 7 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. Uh, here at Burning Bush Worship Center in Norfolk, Virginia at 405 Pendleton Street. And Burning Bush Worship Center services are every Sunday at 11.30 a.m. But next Friday, we encourage everyone to enjoy their families. We won't be having services here next Friday. Uh, and we wish you an early Merry Christmas. But on the following Friday, which is New Year's Eve, we will have a combined service at 10 p.m. with the Recovery Church and the Burning Bush Worship Center, which is a, will be the watch night service. So I encourage everyone uh, out and about on New Year's Eve, come in, let's take in a meeting, let's take in a service, let's tell somebody, text somebody, share with somebody, so we can all be in a good and safe place on New Year's Eve and a judgment-free zone. Um, you can reach us online at recovery.church forward slash Norfolk or either burningbushwc.org and we'll be looking forward to hearing from each and every one of you. So again, text somebody right now, tell somebody, share with somebody, you know, let them know that we're in the recovery church service tonight. If you're looking for a room to be in, if you're looking for a meeting, this will be the place for you on Friday night at 7 p.m. And we're looking forward to, to sharing a, our victory in recovery. Yes. Sharing our victory in recovery. I'm going to ask right now if Bernard Pennant will come up and lead us in prayer. And after that, we're going to have a worship song. Then we'll have the message. And then after the message, we'll stop streaming. Because at that point, we're going to allow uh, people who are here to share and then we're also going to have some, some awards of our surrender crosses. And so we're going to leave you Facebook uh, after that time because we respect the privacy of those who would like to share with the group that is within the house. But you're perfectly welcome to come in at any time at 405 Pendleton Street and, and take your opportunity to share and be a part of the share. Come on and give us God a hand. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. He is worthy yes, he to is. praise. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just come before your throne room to thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that no matter where we are today, we're not what we used to be yesterday. We thank you, Father God, for one more moment to get it right. We thank you, Father God, for recovery. We thank you, Father God, for salvation. We thank you, Father God, for protection. And it's all you. It all stems from you. We ask right now, Lord God, that you would continue to bless the founder of Recovery Church and the elders and the pastors in this part of Zion, Father God.
We ask even right now that you would keep and continue to touch those that have need of what we want to offer. Lord God, we thank you for opening up this door. We know that at one point people are going to run in here and want to know what it is that we need for salvation. We thank you for the volunteers that even right now are coming. Yeah. We just thank you, Lord. I remember a, a deacon said once, if I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't thank you enough. And I couldn't understand it at that moment because I was new in Christ. But now, Lord God, I can truly say that if I had 10,000 tongues and I started thanking you right now, I would miss one thing to thank you for. Hallelujah. In all these things, we put you first. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. Amen.
My name is Raymond Mo. I'll be uh, bringing the message tonight. We'll be uh, talking about the third step. And it says, we made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. And uh, scripture comparison is, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable yes. unto God, which is your reasonable service. Hallelujah. Father, as I, Lord, stand before your people, Lord, and just share, Lord, my experience, strength, and hope with those that are here, with those, Lord, that might see this on Facebook or other means, Lord. Father, I just pray, Lord God, that your word says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. Yes. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord. Let it so be here, Lord, and speak to me. I give you praise and give you glory. In Jesus' name. I was born in 1950s in, in Buffalo, New York. When I was about six or seven, my father moved us to the projects. And what a, what a change that was. I mean, <laughs> you, you have 12 or 13 buildings full of people. There was gangs. Everywhere. I mean, the other projects behind us was gangs. You go to different parts of the city, there was gangs. The school that I went to was like Cooley High, or it was like uh, if you saw the movie Lean on Me, it was it was just, it was like that. I remember the first day of school, they they hung the principal on the flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh I mean every day there was there was something new that was happening. You know, you have different gangs in the same school and I've seen people jumping out of the third story window and you know doing the, the Julie exams, they were just shooting the pigeons, that was their exams, you know. The teachers were scared. And everything else. Uh, my, on top of that, my father was an alcoholic, and I didn't know what I was going to receive when I got home. Maybe he was going to be in a joyful mood. Maybe he was going to be drunk. Uh, I never knew. So I was pretty much walking on eggshells uh, for the first years of my life. As I as I got older, I I grew a mustache early in life. I, when I was about fifteen, I had a a full mustache, so I was able to go into liquor stores. You know, on my way to school, I would go in there and get my get my pint of Dolly High or Ripple and go go on to school. Uh, school got school got bored. To me, so in my junior year, myself, my brother, and my cousin decided to join the Navy. So we went in on the buddy plan. And when I got to boot camp, I still had so much street in me, I ended up uh, getting into a fight. I was like halfway through my training. And I got put back to day one, so I had to start all over. I was in boot camp for four months. But 
as I, uh, my drug use and drinking progressed when I was in the Navy. Matter of fact, I ended up getting stationed here in Norfolk in, in 1970. And I ended up uh, in, in a side cleaner division. We painted the sides of the ship, you know, keep it nice and painted and, you know, all the rust spots and everything uh, taken off. And I was in charge of uh, the life rafts. You know, if you ever have to abandon ship, you have to stay alert. So they had these little pills that came in like fizzy packs. It was benzene and uh, dexedrine speed. So you can so you can stay alert. Okay, need to say I, I, I ordered all kind of packs and and I ended up uh you know, when, when my ship went over overseas to England and Amsterdam and Scotland and all those places, they, they love speed over there. So I would trade speed for hashish and you name it. And uh, since I was in a special division, I didn't have to worry about customs finding it. You know, they'll bring the dogs on. But the dogs couldn't get down to where I had to stash that. So everybody just before customs, they would give me all their drugs. And I, I would put it away and keep most of it. I ended up getting out to service in 1972. I decided I was going to uh, just take it easy and, you know, draw unemployment for a year, a couple years or whatever, but it just so happened that they were hiring veterans at Ford Motor Company. So I started working at Ford Motor Company in 19, 1972. Needless to say, my drug use continued and it got worse. And it wasn't until 1979 was the first time that I had, I had to take a look at maybe I have a problem. Because I was in the plant and I was high that day. I was stumbling around and uh, I walked past the union office and the, the, the union steward, he came out and he pinned a note on, on my shirt and the note said, Please admit this man, he has a drug problem. He told me to go to the VA hospital. Needless to say, I didn't make it to the VA hospital till the next day. Because when they put me on the bus, some, some of my buddies were uh, getting off early. So I got off the bus, got in the car with them and party that night. You know, as, as addicts, we're always scheming, finding ways to get money and to get drugs. So when I went into the VA hospital, I realized that the state police or the city police, they couldn't come in the hospital and get me. You know, the only people that could do that was the, the feds. And that was only like if you had a murder case or something like that, everything else you with you was protected. And I also found out that I can go on sick leave and when I got my sick leave papers filled out, they would write on their uh, nervous condition. And that, that was good enough, you know, for my job and for the doctors. So I, I ended up, uh, going in and out of the VA hospital five or six times for, you know, 30 days at a time. And I would be able to go in there. After a week, I could come out on weekend pass, smoke all the reef I want to smoke because you couldn't, you know, they would give you a breathalyzer so you couldn't drink and you couldn't use drugs because you had to give up a urine. 
but you could smoke all the reef if you wanted to because it wouldn't show up. So that's ba that's basically what I did, and then it would take about three or four weeks for you know for the insurance company to to pay me my money. So I would get like a lump sum, maybe two thousand dollars. I would save that money and then uh, go to New York City, and I could buy some weight. So so I would do that. During, during that time, I ended up uh, on methadone maintenance for three to four years. And I ended up, uh, I, I wanted to come off, but they told me that they had to wean me off little by little or else, uh, it would, you know, I could possibly die, you know, because of the dosage I was on. But they told me it would take a couple months before I can get low enough to get off. So I decided I couldn't wait a few months, so I, I bought a, about 110 milligram of Valiums, and I, I would buy me a pint of wild lettuce rolls every morning, and, <laughs> and take maybe 10, 10 Valiums, I, I stayed in the stayed in the bed probably for two weeks, you know, because that methadone had your bones and everything like this here. My fingers was was like this. My the hair on my arms was sticking up. So finally, after I got off of that, you know, I ended up uh, over overdosing on methadone. I, I went to the clinic, got my method on, and then woke up a couple days later, I was in the hospital, I had, I had an overdose. That was one of about five uh, overdoses. I was not going to detail about the other ones, but the, the last one in 1984, I was at work at Ford Motor Company again, and went in. I mean, I was I was blasted. I, you know, working in them presses. I, I worked at a stamping plant. You know, you got like them thirty ton presses, and well, somehow I overdosed and fell from the press onto the floor. I remember the ambulance in the plant came and picked me up and uh, took me down to medical. I was able to give him my brother's uh, phone number, so he came and picked me up. So the the union told me I had to come in. That was on a Friday. I had to come in on that Monday to, to go to a hearing. When I went to the hearing, they, they wanted to know what had happened. I told him, I said, I must have had a reaction to some medication. You know, finally, finally I got honest with him and told him, you know, I have a problem. So they uh, ended up sending me out of town to uh, some place in outside of Lewisburg, Pennsylvania called uh, White Deer Run. I went there, me, me and a buddy of mine from the plant. Uh, while, while I was there, I was I was doing my regular routine, you know, playing the game, saying what needed to be said. Uh, my therapist, after about three weeks of being there, he pulled me to the side and he said, uh, he said, you know, you sh you're sliding through this here, th through this program. Why don't you stay another two weeks? And try to work the program and see see what happens. Okay, I agreed to doing that. I stayed for two weeks. I got, I got caught up with some guys that was serious about sobriety. I had, I had no no uh, intentions in getting sober. I just wanted to complete the program so I can keep my job. But what happened was I got caught up with these guys that were serious. And I ended up uh, 
complete the program, and I ended up living in uh, Lewisburg. They they had some houses they called sobriety houses. It was three of us living there, me and two guys from uh, uh, New Jersey. While I was there, I did a, a 90 and 90, that's 90 meetings in 90 days. Actually, I did a, I did a 180 and 90 because I was going to a meeting in the morning, going to a meeting at night. Okay. I didn't know what I was going to do with my wife, I mean, with my life. So a guy told me, said, why don't you pray about it? I said, I don't know how to pray. <laughs> I said, I don't even know what to do. He said, at night when you take your shoes off, throw them under the bed. In the morning, when you get up, you have to get on your knees and get them out. <laughs> right down there, right down there, just say a few words. You know, you know. So I, I did that, and uh, that worked. That worked. it worked. And, and what happened was, my my job found me a a halfway house on the south side of uh, Buffalo. So I ended up going going back to Buffalo, and I went back went back to work. On the first the first day of work, I ended up. Uh, Working on the line, I I had been on the job for a while, so I was pretty good loading. I I would let the stuff stack up and I could leave and you know pile up. It just so happened my wife, she was laid off for seven years, and she was working on the line across from me. I saw her over there and I said to myself, uh, "Let me run over there and say a few words to her." So. When I saw her, I, I told her, I said, I'm, I'm looking for a nice church girl. I said, I, I had the other women and they ain't about nothing. I didn't, I didn't know at the time she was saved. She had been saved for, for years. So I ended up asking her to go to my job, have a UAW day it's at Six Flags. So I ended up, uh, Asking her if she wanted to go. We ended up going there. Had a nice time. I asked her, I said, well, you want to go to Niagara Falls tomorrow? Went to Niagara Falls. I heard bells, you know. <laughs> you know I, I told her, I said, you know, I, I knew that she was the one I was going to marry. So I ended up attending church that she went to. And after 20 after 20 something years of going to church uh you know my my work record improved so much that before nobody they would see me and nobody wanted me to work for them i was always the one who didn't have a job but then after i got i got saved while i was in uh pennsylvania uh, it, it was Easter Sunday, and the guy said, some of us go to this church uh, in Milton, if you want to go. I, I said, okay, I, I went. I, I went to church, I was sitting in the back, just crying, just listening to the word crying. The, the guy, I, I thought I heard the guy say, anybody needs prayer, come up to the front. I walked up to the front, but when I got up there, he had said, anybody needs to receive the Lord <laughs> to come up. I was already up there, it was too late. You know, so I ended up getting saved at that time and got baptized and you know, I, I was I was on my way. When I when I went back to Buffalo, I ended up going to the hospital that I overdosed in when I was in treatment at, at the hospital. I, I was in treatment, somebody brought me some drugs, I OD in treatment. So I asked them if I could start an NA meeting at the hospital. They said, okay, that's fine. Started the meeting there. Uh, 
the meetings started getting so intense that people started getting saved in the meetings. And finally, the people from NA said, you know, we can't have this here. This is an NA meeting, not church. You know, where, where was a, a recovery church then? It, it would have been a perfect, you know, mix. Right, yeah, right. So I end up uh, leaving there and as, as time went on, I, I in 2000 and 2005, I was at work, I, I got hurt. I injured uh, some disc in my back. In 2006, I had my first surgery. And I I couldn't move my left leg. I couldn't I couldn't pick it up for like a year. I dragged it. I had to have surgery on, on my left leg. And then they went in and, and they scraped off some of the discs that was bad. But in 2007, I had a 12-hour back surgery. Uh, the, the surgeon said I had a disc so, so big in my back, in my spine, it was large in my spine, that they couldn't get to it. So he had to get like a little pair of knife in order to dig it out. During that time, the, my uh, spinal fluid thing burst. So that's why the surgery took so long. Well, needless to say, I, I was in so much pain that I ended up taking pain medications for another uh, uh, 11 years. We, we had moved from where we were passing at, moved to Georgia, lived there a while, moved to Jacksonville, Florida, moved there a while, then we ended up moving here to Norfolk. The pastor had been preaching a series on trusting God, stepping out in faith and Speaking the word only, that's the messages I was hearing. Uh, me and my wife went to Georgia to visit her brother. And when I went to bed that night, I heard the Holy Spirit say, trust me. I said, okay, I'm going to trust you. I stopped taking my medication, all of it. Didn't have any withdrawals. I, I was on fentanyl. I was on morphine. I was on oxycontin. I was on, uh, you name it, hydrocodone, oxycodone, all of the, all of the codone. And it was like, it was like that for like, like I said, uh, 11 years. But like four years ago, I, Stop taking all the medication, no withdrawals, no nothing. Matter of fact, my prescription is still at the pain management center. I never, I never picked it up. So I just thank God, you know, that, uh, that he had, had mercy on me, yeah. you know, because I didn't go into details about uh, addiction, we all know how to, got, how to get high. Right. But I want to focus more on sobriety. Amen. You know, for those watching that's, in, that's new in recovery, I will tell you, do 90 meetings in 90 days, get you a sponsor, go to counseling, because after years of using drugs and alcohol, your uh, emotions get numb. Your feelings get numb. And when you, when you stop and some of them things start coming back, you, you're going to need somebody to help you through that. So I, I would go to uh, group meetings and counseling and all of that. So 
And they talk about sobriety demands change. People change your people, places, and things. My, me and my brother was real close. And I knew when I went back to Buffalo that I couldn't hang out with him any longer. So I I had to cut him loose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. In 1990-something, I had surgery on, on my hands for a carpal tunnel. I had to do a lot of a repetitive work on the semi line. So I, I was ended up doing the volunteer work at this uh, mission. So so my brother, he had ended up going to prison. So he asked me, he said, uh, can you come pick me up? I'm getting out in the morning. I said, no, I have to go cook in the morning, you know, for the homeless. So he ended up getting out of prison. Him and my cousin met up together. Uh, he ended up uh, buying some cocaine and he ended up uh, going on life support and and that was it. He, he died. So I would say, you know, whatever you need to do, if you need to cut people loose, most of them, They'll cut you loose. You won't have to cut them loose because you won't have anything in common with them any, any longer. But after that, I uh, just been just been serving the Lord and living life on life's terms. So that that's my story. A lot of it has been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> You know, but thank you for the opportunity because if, I guarantee you, if you continue in your addiction, you either gonna end up in a mental a mental institution, a hospital, you're gonna end up six feet under. That's all I have. Oh. We just want to thank God tonight for that. So wasn't that really something? Amen. How many years was that right? Some total of addiction? Uh, from the age of 13 to probably about 17, 17. 2017? No. 17 years. 17 years. 17 years. 17 years. Amen. And I, I just, I know that it works. I stand here having overcome after 31 years. Amen. Amen. 31 years. Amen. Amen. And, and I know that it works. And my story is somewhat similar to yours. And that, that, that there was a power that, even though I knew the step to get there, I had to understand how to grab a hold of that power and that power grab a hold of me. Yes. Um, like he said something that was very familiar. Playing games. Anybody ever been through playing games? Yeah. Being slicker than slick. You know what I mean? You know, if, 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 if I can't make it, I'll take it. You know what I mean? Um, but we all have come through that. And that, that's a very important part because there's always a time or an inflection point where that comes to an end. And, and prayerfully it comes to an end with life and not with death. Amen. But he says something that, that stuck out to me and I wrote it down. He got caught up with some guys. <laughs> he got caught up with some guys who were serious mm. about surprise. Yes. Isn't that why we're here? Amen. Yes. We're here because we want somebody out there to get caught up with some guys. All right. That are serious about surprise. About surprise. Yes. 
Yeah. And you know, we're going to play games. We're going to skip, we skip to Malou. We're going to fade this way. We're going to fade that way. We're going to stand up and cite the 12 steps front and back and, 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 and look like we're sober mm -hmm. until you turn your back on us or we turn our back on you. But when you get caught up with some guys All right. who are serious about sobriety. So I encourage everyone out there in Facebook to get caught up with somebody. If you don't have a sponsor out there, find a sponsor in here. Yes. We'll, we'll walk you through. We'll stand there with you. We'll sit there beside you. We'll walk you through the steps. We'll help you get the help you need. It may not all be in this meeting, but you may get it through this greeting. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I made that up. Yeah. That's all good. I still got a little left from back in the day. <laughs> Amen. But I just want to encourage everyone, everyone that's out there and even in here, you know what I mean? Don't take sobriety for granted. Right. You know what I mean? You have to let some things go. You have to let some people go. Yeah. You have to let some places go. Mm -hmm. And once you let go, let God. Amen. That's right. Once you let go, let God. Amen. 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 Come on and clap your hands for me if you want. Amen. 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 Uh, this is the part of the service where we turn our cameras off. And we're going to take about a 10 minute break. And in this room, we're going to be sharing or giving the opportunity to share. Because we know sharing is caring. We know that, that the way that we keep it is we give it away. Yes. And we're going to encourage those that would like to, to do just that. If you would like to make your way to 405 Pendleton Street in North of Virginia. And we'll be, we're sure to receive you. We'll be welcome to have you. Uh, we thank God for, for a cyberspace where we can expand this room from the number that's in here to that number that's out there. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yes, it is. Amen. 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 Not just today, but every day. We actually take this and we transfer it to YouTube. So this archive is out there. And we're going to continue to post it. We're going to continue to publish it on our page and on the pages. That we, what we ask you to do is text somebody, tell somebody, hit that share button. Because if you have 500 friends, I can guarantee you there's a number of them need to hear that story. And they need to be familiar and get caught up with some guys Amen. that Amen. take sobriety serious. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of our meeting tonight, God. We thank you, God, for this story. Because not only did he have a story, he also shared with us how he gave you the glory, God. Yeah. Father, we know that you are in every step that we mention, God. Every step that we study, God. So, Lord, we ask that you be in every step that we take. Yeah. So that even those that are listening today, God, will be able to come in and be able to find a room where there's some guys that are serious about sobriety. And from that encounter, and from that meeting, and from that time and that place, that they'll break free, God. And they'll be free from what has held them captive and held them bound for many and many years. These are all things we ask in the message name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 See you later, Facebook. Come on, give God a hand. Hallelujah.